arrests, resignations, costly settlements and damaged reputations, the fallout surrounding the alleged manipulation of LIBOR shows no sign of dying down. On the contrary, the probe is now spreading to other participants involved in the process of establishing one of the key benchmarks for lending rates across the world. And it's getting personal. Hello and welcome back to Analysis Review. With me here to discuss the latest twists in the LIBOR tale are Christine Spola, our investigations editor, and John Plender, FT columnist. Christine, you've been tracking this story for longer than most people around here. Where are we now in the probe and why has it just come back again with now renewed vengeance? Well, this was the week where we saw the first arrests. Uh, three Britons were arrested here in London. Uh, they weren't charged, but uh, it shows that, the fi that LIBOR has kind of moved from the phase of the institutions toward the individuals. And now regulators are talking to the individuals and trying to find out the links between uh, traders and in this case, interdealer brokers were also arrested this week. Explain just quickly, interdealer brokers, what uh, because that a lot of people alighted on that that this was now moving on to a sort of different uh, part of the chain. Well, as we understand the the LIBOR allegations, it was communications between traders and other people in the network that that set the rates. The interdealer brokers seem to have been the human conduit now conversations moving through them, what did they know, uh, were they actually uh, in any way profiting or were, were the bankers using them as a way to find out information about others. John, what are we seeing in terms of consequences for corporate governance, for regulation, for, for indeed for shareholders? Well, uh, on the face of it, it's been very tough for shareholders. They've been hit very hard and they cannot control traders in banks. Boards can't control traders in banks, so you might think it's very tough for them. But having said that, I think this raises a very big question about the sort of dialogue that institutional shareholders have with boards. Because in the end, why things go wrong, as they have done in LIBOR, but also with all the other sorts of things, wh whether it's mis-selling to retail customers or whatever, is that the incentive structures are flawed. And the big question is whether institutional shareholders can get into that sufficiently to have an effect and whether they can engage in a dialogue with the banks on the softer issues like culture. Do you think, what, what, how do you rate those chances? Well, I think there is a growing consciousness among the institutions that they have to get further into those issues, and some already do. Um, but there are other professional fund management groups where corporate governance, and these issues are about corporate governance, but there are fund managers who treat corporate governance as something separate and in a ghetto. And meantime, the mainstream fund managers just focus on uh, short-term financial performance narrowly defined. There's something that has to be done about that. Right. How damaging is this for the City of London? Well, it's obviously not helpful for the City of London, but having said that, I think the users of markets recognise that traders everywhere, if they're not properly controlled, will engage in these kind of activities. I think in the end, the real thing, the, the real issue, is about the legitimacy of these big financial institutions. That's the question. And the real thing we have to worry about is whether the new brooms at places like Barclays or UBS mm -hmm. are capable of actually getting these institutions back on track, reflecting decent values and operating with integrity. Right. And I think that's part of the issue that uh, this week we're expecting more settlements. Uh, Barclays had a settlement this summer. We're, uh, we've been told UBS is near a settlement. What the banks don't like about these settlements is it was a firestorm after Barclays settlement. Now you're going to have UBS and we hear RBS and again it's uh, they're worried about the backlash and they're worried about how does this affect the reputations in a year when the banks have had a really hard time um, with a lot of uh, issues and, and fraud and you know different settlements that they've had to face. All right, so there's no, you don't see, you still see quite a lot of work for you and your team then on this one. Oh, absolutely. The, you know, the FT has had people since February, really a team of about 20 people looking at different aspects of this. Because it's a very global uh, phenomenon. I mean, I did ask John about the city, but it, to be fair, it's not just limited to London. It, is it? It's, it's very global. And our U.S. office, really, the, the, the U.S. regulators took the, took the lead on the LIBOR um, uh, investigations and so we knew last year and we had reported in September of last year that criminal charges were likely. Part of the settlements that uh, that come out is that they are staving off. The banks want to stave off the criminal charges and what they do is they reach these settlements with uh, the CFTC and also the, the London regulator. Christine Spola, we could talk a lot more about this but unfortunately we've run out of time so thank you very much and thank you John Plender. 
and thank you for watching. For more on the LIBOR scandal, please go to ft.com forward slash LIBOR. And to catch up on other stories covered by our analysis team, please go to ft.com forward slash analysis. Until the next time, goodbye.